Well, it's, I think the most important thing is that it works. <laughs> it's a great education system and it works. And if it didn't work, it would never survive. You know, it's it's a it's a good system. It's it's it meets the requirements of um, of life for for children, regardless of whether it was 1921 or 2021. It it it's it step it it steps up to whatever the modern age presents to it, and that's why it has survived so long. All of them, really. I mean, he, he, you know, his his basic philosophy that children should be free to make choices about their own lives, that they should live as equals with adults, that um, that um, they should be able to find their own way through through academic learning. Um, all of those things are what he stood for, and we still stand for them at Summerhill today. In a way, a lot, and in a way, very few, you know. Um, the philosophy has not changed at all. So children who were here in, in 1930 would still find they felt comfortable with the Summerhill today, and the same the other way around. But, of course, life has changed a lot, and we now have internet and so on and so forth, which my father could not have even dreamt would ever exist. So, um, but I think as I said earlier, you know, one of the things that makes Summerhill so enduring is that it is able to embrace whatever comes along because it's an organic process. It's a, it's a democratic community um, or it's a, a community in which we use democracy to, to, to move forward and, and make our, our school um, function. And so um, whatever comes along, we discuss it, we make rules about it and we get on with life. So that's why it works so well. Well, all generations are slightly different and, um, you, you know, parenting has made a lot of difference. I, I don't think that children fundamentally change. And I think that, that society tends to imagine that we human beings have changed, but actually we still are the, uh, you, you know, the, the 10,000 years ago people that we were. We still have the same needs. We still have the same desires and wants. We just, we just, sell them in a different way we communicate differently and so on but you know we all we all are so if you look at children their needs are the same as the needs of children 500 years ago 5000 years ago they need to play they need to have independence they need to learn how to work out certain problems for themselves but of course they need to have a strong structure around them so whether that was a tribe um, or whether it was a, 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 a nomad family or whether it was a tribe or whether it's you know today, um, it's they have the same needs. I think at the moment we have quite a problem with parents um, uh, being too liberal in a way with their children and that sounds strange coming from me because i run summerhill but i think there is a um everybody is trying to uh, everybody in the world is trying to pursue happiness and everybody's trying to make life wonderful and i think that's a mistake for all of us i think and, and it's a mistake for children as well life cannot be wonderful things sometimes go wrong sometimes you can't have what you want to have and i think modern parenting um, finds that quite difficult they want Modern parenting wants their children to have just a wonderful time. And if they want a bag of sweeties, they can have a bag of sweeties. And, and they find it very difficult to put um, constraints on their children, but in a, an equal and, um, and, and uh, in a way that, that is open to discussion and negotiation. Well, always financial challenges because we are a school, we are a business and we have fees, we have, you know, staff to pay and we have lots of overheads and all those boring things that all businesses have. 
um, but also uh, I think we're very much the we're very much dependent on the latest trend in in education regarding the government. So, you know, if the government suddenly say they want to raise standards in schools and they want children to to pass more exams, then they demand that all schools do that. And they include Summerhill, which can make things difficult for Summerhill, because if we have to concentrate on one particular aspect, which is not part of our philosophy, then it makes life difficult. And as with, you know, in 2000, when we went to court against the government, that is a, an example of what can happen. And I think it could happen again at some point, you know, that we will have demands put upon us that are so strict that we're unable to comply without um, a fight. It's a difficult one because parents have an expectation, the world has an expectation that academic achievement is the best thing that you can have. And until people can begin to realize more that emotional well-being um, is, is as important, probably I would say more important, um, then it makes it difficult. So we now have a system of schools, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure it happens across, across the Western world too, that we have a situation where schools are providing a lot of academic challenges for children and they're, uh, and they're providing a lot of academic pressure and then we're seeing that there are a lot of mental health problems in schools and lots and lots of children have, have, have lots and lots of problems and they have lots of conditions which are diagnosed because basically they're stressed and they're being pushed too hard so um, as, as long as that's happening um, you know education is, is, is failing in what it's doing and I think that Summerhill education can can be here to 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 enlighten other people, but I'm not sure we can actually help to change. I mean, the changes would be enormous, but I think a, a change from that academic thrust. And for me, simple things like um, adults being more approachable and more equal in schools. You know, in most schools, adults still have to be called by their surname. They still have to be addressed in a certain way by the pupils. The adults are, are important and the children are their, um, uh, like their workers. They have to do as they're told. And I think that that in itself is very damaging. And if pupils could, if, if teachers could step down from what in England we call their high horses and start to be more human themselves and, and, and prepared to, to discuss things more on an equal basis, um, they don't have to relinquish their their authority, but to, to be able to discuss things, for children to feel they can approach teachers much more to discuss things would, would make a huge difference. Well, is this the original of uh, that dreadful school of Neil's? I mean, it's a very old fashioned book now. <laughs> Um, I, I don't really know what, what I can say about it, except that historically it's very interesting as well. But, you know, it's a living history. So, so reading that book, it was written a long time ago by a man who was actually a Victorian. He was born in Victorian times. And so he wrote that book. Um, it, it's, it's a very interesting historical document, as well as a, a, as a, a, a book about Summerhill. But it's actually a, a living document as well, because we are continuing with his basic philosophy now, not because we think A.S. Neal is like a god and we hold him up as an idol, but because it actually works. And all the things that he talks about actually work. And so that's why it's fundamentally such a... Uh, an amazingly interesting philosophy and and so the book will be interesting as well